All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm here today with two of the most thoughtful speech pathologists I know, Kate Flaxman and Marge Blanc. Um, and before I get to their introductions, our usual housekeeping notes, um, you do need to be logged into your YouTube account if you would like to comment or ask a question. Um, we love hearing from you and about you. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to introduce yourself. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can, um, but we likely may follow up with a separate uh, session for some Q&A since this is such a, an important and comprehensive topic. Um, all right, so first uh, to introduce Kate Flaxman, who is a speech language pathologist with a specialty in augmentative and alternative communication. She's had a diversified experience working with individuals with complex communication needs who benefit from AAC in early intervention, schools, adult placement settings, homes, and employment. She strives to promote communication for the purpose of improving lives through interactions with parents, peers, caregivers, and school personnel. Since the start of the pandemic, she's been learning about different language learning theories and considerations for AAC. Welcome, Kate. Uh, and now back again, we have Marge Flunk, who has been a speech language pathologist for over 40 years and began systematically applying the research results of Barry Prezant, Amy Weatherby, and colleagues who discovered that the steps of Gestalt language development apply to all Gestalt language processors. Marge has been spearheading this movement toward recognizing and nurturing natural language acquisition, and we're so excited to have her back. So I with that, <laughs> with that, uh, I will hand it over to you two, and we're so excited to learn more about this. So, well, um, I, wanted to start by saying that I'm honored to be talking with Marge today um, and that uh, this is a really new topic for all of us. And we, as we talk, um, there's a lot more questions than we have answers at this point. And these are um, jumping off points for further exploration and research. And to just follow up on that, um, you know, Kate discovered natural language acquisition um, a year and a half ago uh, because she cared so much about all of these um, elements of language acquisition. And she will tell the story better than me, but she started applying what she had learned probably the next day because it made such intuitive sense to her. And I think that one of our goals today is that what we are going to present to you, even though, as Jen said, we really don't have like answers, like do this first, do this next, do this after that. We have a lot of really valuable thinking um, at our fingertips because there are many people now who are taking this topic really to heart and trying some things out with their Gestalt language processors, who we will define in just a moment, um, who are AAC communicators. So um, I don't know, this is a little out of order, um, Kate, but before I talk about um, the stages of natural language acquisition or Gestalt language processing, should we define AAC since we're already using that term? Sure. So AAC stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. Um, it includes any uh, method of communication um, that is um, an alternative to uh, oral speech. So um, it includes gestures, um, signs, um, pictures for communication, symbols. Uh, there's paper-based communication some systems, anything, any written communication, text, email, um, and 
what people think of as, you know, communication devices um, that may be technology based. Um, and then what we have also started to include was things like um, YouTube and other thing, uh, other uh, communication modalities that are not necessarily thought of as communication by other people. So there's a lot of people out there who may benefit from augmentative and alternative communication, which is frequently abbreviated AEC. Um, and really all of us use some forms of AEC if you think about it, you know, we all use different communication modalities when we communicate, but some people are unable to utilize oral speech for their, as their primary communication method. Um, so anybody who has a developmental disability or an acquired um, disability, such as, as cerebral palsy, autism, stroke, uh, traumatic brain injury, ALS, I'm just rattling off a few. Um, so they may benefit from AEC. Um, for anybody who is not an SLP who is listening, um, you should talk to the person's SLP. If you're interested in learning more about AEC, that's typically um, a good starting point. And there's lots of uh, options out there for AEC that you may not know about. Um, and there's lots of information also out there to uh, learn about AEC. So all of this was wonderful for me because my last real time spent with AEC was 25 years ago, well, not quite, 20 years ago. And back in the day, you know, I really kind of defined and used AAC the way that Kate is um, talking about in a broad sense, but so much has changed. And when Kate talks about a robust AAC system that we would you know, in the old days, we would have said, oh, that's a high tech kind of system. But when Kate talks about a robust AAC system, what we are realizing as we talk more and more in this little new community of Gestalt language processing and AAC, we're realizing that those devices that children are now accessing, you know, more and more, which has been a great triumph for so many people who've worked so hard for that to happen. But we realize that they don't necessarily satisfy everything that a Gestalt language processor would need to kind of get in to that robust system. And that's what we wanna really talk about today. Um, and Joe could show us page two now, and we could really look at what, what is the conundrum? What is it about um, this gestalt language processing that kind of throws a curve here? Is that page visible? Yep, it's up. Okay, good. So, as you look at this chart, it's the top of it says natural language acquisition. It doesn't say Gestalt language development. And some of you might be saying, well, what is Gestalt anyway? And what's, why, why do you keep saying that word? And the reason for both of these terms is that the terminology Gestalt, we all know that Gestalt is like, you know, the German word for the whole. Um, but Gestalt language is something that um, we, in, in the field that Kate and I are in, we learned about a long time ago. Um, and it might have been just in the literature. Um, in Kate's case, she might not have been there for that moment of revelation. But for those of us who were there in 1983, 
um, when Ann Peters coined the term, she was looking at two styles of language acquisition, natural language acquisition. And so back in the day, that was 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there was all kinds of qualitative research going on, qualitative being like following a, a little kid around, listening to that little child, you know, as they were falling asleep at night, recounting their day, and listening to a child talk to siblings and parents and friends just naturally to figure out for the first time, how does language actually develop? I mean, before the 60s, we really didn't have data on that. So that research was really the foundation of the entire field of speech language pathology. So back in the day, Ann Peters said, you know what, there are two styles of language acquisition, one of which is the one that we always think of as being typical, and that is what we all say, oh, his first word. And then we say, oh, his first word plus another word. And this little tiny phrase that um, we think is just perfect and wonderful, we understand it. The child is typically saying one word at a time, so he's usually pretty intelligible. And our AAC systems actually are set up for that kind of what we now call analytic processing to differentiate it from gestalt processing or holistic processing. So the thing that is, as you look at this chart, you're gonna see that there are six stages to this process for a gestalt language processor. But here's the trick. By the time a Gestalt language processor gets to um, stage three, they are ready for a one word plus one word system, whether it's oral speech or whether it's AAC. Regardless, you know, sign language is the same thing. A Gestalt language processor using sign language will start with a Gestalt, a Gestalt sign, and then learn the nuances of the sign to say, oh, this is referring to you, this is referring to me, and differentiate those things that an analytic processor does um, when they are putting two words together. So Gestalt language processing is no different, except that there are two extra stages to it, which makes it a little inconvenient for some of us because they happen first. And so before a child is doing one word plus another word, they've got to go through stage one and stage two. They have no choice. That's who they are neurologically set up to be. And that's what we as Kate and her colleagues and me and my colleagues working together are starting to grapple with. Like, how is it that we who understand this extra two stages are going to make it possible to add on to our devices. So take a look at stage one. It, it, let me just ask Jen if there's any questions right now. I mean, I realize we're in the midst of it, so. Not yet. Is that okay? Okay, so what happens at stage one, and it is a gestalt. So what happens with a gestalt language processor is that the first language that they pick up from the sound stream when they're little infants is a whole chunk. It's like a whole melody, a whole song, a whole story. And people knew that back in the 60s, 70s and 80s. It wasn't really written down very well until Ann Peters wrote it down in 1983. But from then on, we've had knowledge of this. It's just been, it's not been kind of front and center in our minds because we figured it out a long time ago, but we've kind of lost track of it, I will say. Anyway, that language is a chunk and oftentimes it is a melody. And like Kate alluded to at the beginning here, sometimes our AAC is going to include those clips from let's just say YouTube or in Jen's case, mom singing, 
or, you know, all of the musicality that it turns out our little gestalt processors love. Back in the day, they were known as intonation babies because they loved that melody. And that's where the meaning came from, was in those melodic contours. So you look at the examples in the middle column there. And by the way, this is a handout. You will have access to this as a handout. But you look at what the holes are. And the reason they're written this way, all clumped together, is because a gestalt child who hears A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, there are no pauses. There are no places to stop. It's one unit. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear so-and-so. Happy birthday to you. It's a unit. And we know of so many of our Gestalt processors who would either say or pick that whole song to celebrate something wonderful. So whether you are a speaker or whether you are an AAC communicator, those Gestalts are the real first language. And Kate liked this phraseology we have under the description here. And this is a way to think about it. And it is. The gestalts are the soundtrack. They're not words. And that's the tricky part is that adults think, oh, it's a word. It's a word. Well, no, not if you're a gestalt processor. It's the soundtrack. It's the soundtrack of an episode of life or an episode of that YouTube might clip out for you, an episode from a movie. It is an episode. And Barry Prasant, who is the other really key researcher in this whole um, history, talked about episodic memory as being part and parcel of Gestalt thinking which isn't always exactly the same as Gestalt language, but we're going to talk about that more as we move on because oftentimes they are one and the same. Barry Prasant's estimate of the number of autistic individuals who are Gestalt language processors is 75%. So we don't have like absolute clear data on this, but if we start to think about Gestalt processors among us, and we listen to autistic adults talk about their early language, we realize that that estimate, which did come from other research, but it was in Great Britain, um, might be pretty close to accurate. So just before you worry about what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, and what if I don't know my child as a Gestalt language processor, and you're gonna give me all these nice strategies, what if it turns out not to be true? Well, something that we'll talk about later is you're not gonna hurt anything by adding extra words to an analytic processor. So let's just say you have a pretty good analytic processor who's interested in kitty, doggy, fish, and you say with your gestalt, hey, it's a fish. Hey, it's a doggy. You're not going to do any harm. Okay, so now stage two, the other stage. Before you go on, so we do have a question, and I think that you're both going to address these things, but just to make sure. So you, you sort of, you addressed what percentage of our kids would you say are Gestalt processors? Um, they also asked, how do we know who is a Gestalt processor? And are you saying that all language learners are Gestalt? You mean all Gestalt language learners are Gestalt thinkers? No, there's, they are, all... are you saying that all language learners are Gestalt, but no. Well, oh, no, no, no. Um, sorry. Thank you, Jen. That was a very important question. No, no, no. Um, I mean, among um, neurodiverse kids, I would say that Barry Prasant's estimate of 75% being gestalt might be fairly accurate from what we can kind of discern. But among neurotypical um, kids who might be dyspraxic, have a praxia of speech, 
um, not have any um, sensory motor issues besides um, speech access or perhaps motor access. No, those kids might well be analytic. No, there's among neurotypical kids, I don't know what percentage would be accurate. I used to think about 50-50 because um, boys tend to be gestalt processors and girls tend to be analytic processors, but that's not totally true. Um, yeah, so no, we don't, we don't know that at all. It's just that as Kate was pointing out as we were talking one day, if you add a gestalt to your AAC system, because you think this child might be a gestalt processor, it's not gonna hurt anybody, that's all. And in terms of how to determine if your child is a gestalt language processor, we will talk about that if I ever give Kate a chance to tell all the parts that are going to be before me talking again. <laughs> but we will, we will definitely come back to that. Okay. Okay. And the reason I'm kind of anxious for you to see stage two is you will see that Gestalt language processors are going to get to the stage that they're using one word plus one word. It will happen. And stage two helps them get there. And it's the stage where kids learn that there are commonalities in long sentences or even short sentences. And they learn that if we um, give them language in their environment that says, it's a doggy, it's a kitty, it's a cow, they're gonna learn it's a, has a pretty strong um, usefulness when you're labeling things. So that's gonna help kids get to the labeling stage, which is stage three. And if you say things like, let's go to the store, let's go to your room, let's go to the porch, let's go to the park, then a child who is a Gestalt language processor is going to learn that, that the phrase, let's go to the, is common to many things that are incredibly fun. And that is stage two. So the way this chart is set up, this is a chart that is applicable to all kids, but it's made a little bit more specific for AAC communicators. So you can see some of the gestalts at the top that might be very typical for a musically oriented gestalt processor. And then down at the bottom of each of these little squares in, this, in the middle with the example, you see one that I use always with this chart because it shows how it breaks down when you get to stage two. So just to look at the phrase, uh, the phraseology, let's get out of here. You know, common thing that big brother might say. Want some more? Common thing that mom might say. So those would be typical of early gestalts for many, many kids. Um, then you look at, how kids will mix and match at stage two, which is in the vernacular, which we inherited from a long time ago, we're kind of stuck with the vernacular, um, but when it becomes mitigated or segmented or cut in parts and recombined, um, you can see at the top, the child learns, everybody loves A, B, C, D. You know, when you're gonna put it up on the chalkboard, it says A, B, C, D. And then they learn to you from, you know, happy birthday to you, A, B, C, D, to you. Uh, and then the song, if you're happy and you know it. So um, you're happy. Um, where did it go? Uh, sing with me. So something from the ABC song added to um, if you're happy and you know it, added together. And that's the essence of stage two. And that's the mitigation. Down at the bottom of that example square is the, the, the example I always use in a chart. So I figured I better use it here just to be consistent with following it through. So you take, let's get out of here. And a child learns that let's get is 
a part of a gestalt that can be used in many, many places. Let's get toys. Let's get more. Let's get something to eat. Let's get becomes a little phrase that can be mixed and matched with others. So let's get some more. And then what was the original gestalt from mom? Want some more? Um, want out of here? Or want out of here? Depending on your particular frame of mind. Um, then if that makes sense, Jen, does that seem like it flows well enough for people? Yeah, I think so. Okay, then let's just skip to stage three really quickly, and then we will pause here because then you'll have the nuts and bolts of it. Um, down at stage three, what happens is kids are finally, and it doesn't take long with little kids, with older kids whose gestalts haven't been acknowledged, maybe it'll take longer. And it's very individual for that reason. But when kids get to stage three, they can say or access, get more, want out. So truncated down to one word plus one word, just like an analytic processor. Now, the reason I have these other examples below it is because what happens at stage three is that kids for the first time, if they're Gestalt language processors, for the first time are referring to specific single words. And Kate and I will talk about that a good bit later about the referencing concept. But as kids get to this point, this beautiful point of stage, you know, pointing, haha, point of stage three, then we want, and our devices are perfect for this mixing and matching of single words, not to start making sentences yet. That's not until we get to stage four. And that's just even beginning, beginning grammar. And then stage five and six, get into more grammar. But before we get there, we have to make sure that our Gestalt kids have the opportunity to reference like analytic processors have from the get go. So as you're playing with your AAC communicator, ball, red, not grammatical, ball, blue, table, ball, red, blue. So you're just adding one word plus one word, just like the beginning analytic processor would. You're giving the Gestalt processor the opportunity, in a sense, to catch up. And we don't want to rush into grammar. And there's a couple of reasons for that. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves developmentally. That's important. But also, we don't want the Gestalt processor to say, oh, I want a ball. Oh, that sounded like back at stage two. Let's get a ball. No, that's going to kind of not send that individual back to stage two, but it's going to make moving forward a bit more complicated and tricky. So we want to pause. We really want to pause right there and put together referential word plus referential word, like those particular examples, just nouns, adjectives, location words, and stay away from the verbs for a while. Because the minute we get into verbs, we get into grammar and we get into what the old gestalts sounded like. So if you want later to listen to this part again and look at this chart and say, oh, okay, okay, okay. Boring, no grammar yet, okay. No sentence strip yet, okay. But it really is important and especially important as children are older because they haven't had this opportunity. And if you guys are okay with taking this um, off the screen, we could do that. Um, so 
So I guess this is a good time to talk about how AEC systems that currently exist are built for analytic processors. Um, all of the um, already, so there's a lot of um, technology-based systems out there, um, apps and what are known as speech generating devices, things that are, are dedicated. Um, that have uh, pre-created vocabulary that other um, either company or speech language pathologist has uh, put a lot of thought and effort into um, setting up it. Um, they're all, um, they contain all parts of speech so that you can start making those sentences and you can introduce um, both what we, we call core vocabulary, which is all of those action words and, um, and fringe vocabulary, which is more nouns and being able to use the core vocabulary across settings, which really is um, promoted as good AEC practice. Um, but when you think about it, these systems are not set up for Gestalt language processors. And um, when I heard Marge present for the first time, my brain literally exploded. And I was thinking how processing language doesn't really have anything to do with speech. I mean, speech is the output that we get at the end of processing language, but um, even for our non-speaking students, they um, are still processing and they may be processing in a way differently than we would have imagined. So, um, we need to be able to identify those students who may be um, a Gestalt language processor and tweak their hopefully existing AEC systems, um, looking at not, we are not advocating um, making any any changes, there are no, a better system for a Gestalt language processor doesn't exist besides the fact that they need to stay um, with essentially an analytic system because we need them to eventually move to that system once they need access to, um, to those single words. Furthermore, aided language input or aided language simulation um, modeling without expectation, all of those things, um, and showing, demonstrating on that, that person's, um, communication system, language is best practice and they need to, so they really need to have access to, um, once identified as a Gestalt language processor, they need to have access to essentially like both systems um, or both layouts I, is a better way of putting it. Um, so adding Gestalt into an existing system um, is probably, at least from my conversations with Marge um, and best, what we know to be best practice, the, the best way to support these language learners. Um, so that's, that's what we're advocating for at this point in time. Um, and then Marge, my question for you is how do we best identify somebody who is non-speaking, who may, who we're gonna guess is a Gestalt language processor? Right. And, you know, when you and I have talked about that, Kate, my tendency, you know, I'm really a clinician at heart. And so my tendency is like, oh, well, we'll just 
get in there and watch and pay attention and see how things go and, you know, try things out. And, but um, you challenged me to really kind of come up with a bit of a list. So I did. And now this, this is not, a. I mean, first of all, this isn't a complete list. And secondly, it's not a list that will necessarily apply to very many, uh, let's see, not everything on this will apply to anyone. In fact, not even a handful of things will necessarily apply to a single child. But, and I realize I'm hesitating, sorry. Their ideas. It's, okay. <laughs> there is probably the most salient quality if you could look at it in a multitude of ways is that the child is very interested in holes. And it comes back to that use of the term gestalt. I mean, who's the child who cares if the entire set of um, you know, seven dwarfs is together and gets stored in a box together and never lost and resists, you know, quote, what we sometimes think of as sharing those dwarfs, because you know what? Seven dwarfs is a thing. And so if in our current vernacular, we say, if it's a thing, it's a gestalt. And if it's a thing and a child is very interested in that thing remaining intact, that's a pretty good clue. And then when you start to apply that kind of premise to other things, you think, wait a minute. Oh, like the ABCs, it's a thing. You don't wanna pull out the B and do something with the B and oh, let's play with you know B words today. Now, as a child gets older and as a child moves on through this process, it is a natural process. So there will be a time when the child is gonna be very interested in looking at all the B words, no question. But at the beginning, at the beginning, the alphabet is a thing. And so if you're looking at a very young child, um, you know, those are the children who sometimes, you know, are able to look at the printed word and recognize how letters fit together into words because it's not a single letter. It's not a, this is a, a, a sound symbol correspondence. It's a thing, it fits together. And so pattern learning is another clue. Um, the child who really wants to have the puzzle complete. And if somebody wants to you know, do the puzzle with them and has the same idea in their head, that's like the best ever. And something that, that a phrase that I learned from Kate is shared reference. And I think that when a Gestalt child very often is very, very visual also, not absolutely, none of these things are like 100%, it's really not a checklist at all, but often that child is very, very visual and even kind of, you might say pretty right-brained because they love all these things like the whole everything, the whole episode, the whole birthday party scenario. Let's do the birthday party scenario again. Let's read that book again. Let's do it in the same room with the same candles and the same sparkles and the same sprinkles again. And that is the episode. Um, and it, you know that is kind of a pattern in a way, but it's, it's one that you store in your brain. I don't, I'm terrible at that. But the people who are good at that will have that in their brain, not because they've memorized it. No, it's just there. It's just there. And so then go back to patterns again. And so many of the Gestalt processors, and you could say sometimes that's Gestalt language, but again, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence here. So we have to be detectives and we have to be willing to play a little bit and say, hmm, did that resonate? Was that, was that important? Did I do the right thing? 
and be willing to say, nope, I don't think so. I don't think I hit the mark. Because, you know, something that Kate and I talk about a lot is with any partnership in this shared referencing and shared input and output, we need to be trustable people. And that doesn't mean we have to be right all the time, but we do need to be trustable. And so if a child is going to buy in to us as language modelers or participants in this joint process, we have to be trustable enough to say, I don't think that was a very good idea. You know, my child didn't like that at all. And so just going back to patterns for a second, you know, sometimes a gestalt processor isn't really good at like counting and math and things like that because they're starting with a whole and they would far prefer to take the whole and cut it into quarters and put it back together again. And that would be the gestalt way, like with a puzzle, for instance, or anything else where there are patterns that fit together nicely, like do these things fit within that shape? Is it an exact fit? And there's a bit of perfectionist sometimes in that quality. You know, those of us who are not gestalt, like me, you know, it's like, oh, well, I didn't do it quite right. Who cares? But if you know in your mind how it's supposed to be and you can't replicate it, like let's just say with a fine motor system, then that's, that's distressing. And so it is one reason that a lot of our kids are going to prefer the version that's on YouTube because it works, you know, it worked out right. And I try to replicate that with my own little, you know, manipulables and it just isn't as good. So, yeah, go ahead, Kate. I wonder, and listening to you think, talk and think about this, like, um, I wonder if that's where a lot of communication breakdowns occur with non-speaking Gestalt language processors because the um, shared referent is is only with certain people who have that um, background knowledge and the context in which they can replicate that shared experience, and it becomes necessary for the individual to come up with um, either ways to communicate that with other people to be able to replicate that, or there's just, they experience that communication breakdown and they, they're unable to, to replicate it um, and communicate that message. That's such a good word, replicate. You know, and, and it goes back to um, a former guest on this um, webinar series whose name is Molly and her sweet little daughter um, is a speaker. But so many of these qualities that you're talking about, Kate, you know, happen whether your child is a speaker or not a speaker or not a reliable speaker. And the way Molly said it is, she feels like the value in replicating the original whatever thing, Gestalt episode, whatever, is to be able to recreate the feeling you had the first time around. And so there's a, a strong emotional quality to all of this as well. Um, and I think that, you know, we've talked about in other um, webinars, we've talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, where the, um, where, where's the emotion, you know, and, and, and as you say, Kate, when we have this shared reference, are we sharing the emotion of it? Right. And if we're not, you know, probably with any communicator, you know, that shared emotion and that shared feeling, that relationship quality is imperative. But I can see you're ready to add to that in a really good way. Um, so I want to, um, I want to add that 
if you this if you have identified somebody who is possibly a AEC user who you think is a Gestalt language processor, going back to the original um, source of the Gestalt is going to be really important. Um, so taking either a recording of the original person or the recording of the episode or wherever the source material is. Um, Marge has identified that as being extremely important when it comes to um, make, adding some of these uh, whole, whole messages, whole phrases um, onto existing AEC systems, especially when it comes to ones that have voice output um, of, of some sort. Can I? Um, Do you want to talk about, um, Kate, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about a couple of the um, uh, kind of homegrown experiments that have gone on that kind of illustrate that. Sure. Jen, what was your question? Well, okay, so there's there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, and so we might have to wait until the end for some of them. But one of the themes I'm seeing is, um, you know, um, people worrying about their non-speaking children um, and, you know, communication. Some may have access to AAC already, some don't. Um, but I kind of I kind of just wanted to say to everybody to keep in mind that even if your child doesn't yet have access to AAC, or even if they do and they don't have all of their, and they don't have gestalts yet or, you know, programmed in, or they um, are not using it as some may want or expect them to yet, please know that your child is already communicating with you. And there's, you know, they may be doing things. Someone had mentioned their um, daughter watching a lot of YouTube. And so she is likely saying a lot that maybe we aren't programmed to pick up on because it's just kind of how we're all conditioned to not necessarily like look for these things or listen for these things. Um, but even if a child can't yet speak or doesn't yet have full access to AAC, I just want to let everybody know that like they're communicating a lot and it's just that we're conditioned to kind of miss it. So I'm gonna post um, an article um, by Vikram Jaswal in this post. Um, it was a study that he did of mothers of non-speaking children and how um, when they can kind of tune into what their children are already doing, it changes everything. And um, so I just, I had to say that because people are worried. <laughs> yeah, and I also, I, I wholeheartedly believe that um, people, everybody is, is born to communicate, um, you know, babies cry when they need something. We're all, we're all born to communicate and looking at, um, like how somebody is communicating or is possibly communicating and then the communication partner establishing that they recognize that the person is possibly communicating a message and what the interpretation of that message is, is really important. Um, no matter what um, the person is doing or their, their physical ability, um, you know, I have worked with, um, you know, children with cerebral palsy who have very limited movements and when they, being able to identify, you know, I, I see that you're making this facial expression, you look uncomfortable and just telling them, this is the message that you're communicating and creating that shared ref, again, going back to that shared referent, um, it really helps everybody being able to 
say out loud what you think that message is and then understand so that they can start to learn that, oh, when I do this, this means this to that person. Um, so watching. It also cuts down on a lot of stress for the child. Right. When, right. Yeah. Because it, there stops being that guessing game. It becomes a little bit more predictable. It becomes much more predictable. Um, but, you know, I, why, <laughs> that was my first first thought when I, when I heard Marge talking about, about gestalt language processing, the students that I work with who watch YouTube clips um, in very specific situations, um, the same ones, me, and then playing that guessing game with how do we identify um, what that means to them, but the parents were really adept at being able to come up with that meaning. And the more they, they established that like general meeting, the more the children used more video clips to communicate more stuff because they realized, Oh, when I mom realizes or dad realizes when I do X that I'm communicating, I'm going to do more of X because they're, they're understanding the message. Do you, do you want to tell one of those stories that has uh, come up in the last several days? Um. <laughs> it's really <laughs> just an illustration of what you just said, uh, but how my favorite, um, my favorite example the, is, is, uh, a student was driving in the car with, with their mom and all of a sudden in the back seat, mom hears, hears the kids like playing on YouTube, just like we all do with our kids at this point. And uh, all of a sudden mom hears, it's such a nice day outside or whatever the, the clip was. It was, and it, that was, but it was repeated several times, meaning like, this was what I was trying to communicate. Um, that's also a student who is very adept at finding messages um, through through uh, YouTube. Um, but at this point, looking at adding um, some of those sound clips that can be used for various purposes, not just, not just requesting, um, but various purposes and, and, uh, ensuring that there's access, easy access to them besides YouTube. I think YouTube is a very cumbersome way of accessing language, um, especially when you are looking at, um, you know, all of the messages that somebody may want to communicate. And I think one in the last couple of days that I was thinking of was um, the little one who would play the clip. And you guys know Daniel Tiger better than me, but um, I love being with my family. And the parent was recognizing that that clip was being played every time that child was celebrating with um, their parents this moment of happiness. And so, like Kate says, if you have access to that clip, a little bit easier than having to go back to YouTube and find it and play it. But if you had access to that clip um, or and or that um, it's being acknowledged by a parent to mean I'm really happy that then that helps lead to this stage two, yeah. where at some point, and we don't want to rush it because, you know, I mean, I kind of hate the term buy-in, but we do want the child to completely buy in to the fact that we are part of the shared referent. And what that means, what does buy-in mean? It's trust. I mean, so the child has to trust that we get it, that we honor it, that we're not trying to change it, but 
that's going to be the trick is that by not changing it, we also want to broaden it. But we don't want that trust ever to be diminished. Yeah. Do you guys want to tell a Daniel Tiger story? Yeah. Um, I have another story that may be a good example also that's not using YouTube. So um, I recently worked with um, an individual who doesn't yet have um, a voice output communication system. They're still using just uh, gestures and and things like that. And they, um, I don't have proof obviously that they're a, uh, your salt language processor, but what they do is, is they um, essentially recreate episodes with specific people and they have those, they have the um, specific scene with each individual person. So with um, their grandma, they tilt their head to the side and then grandma asks, are you tired? And every time they FaceTime with grandma, she tilts her head to the side and grandma says, are you tired? And, you know, or, you know, and with somebody else, it's another gesture and it means something else. And they recreate that initial experience, you know, that initial episode. And um, again, it makes it very limited because each person has to have their own individual um, context that they, with the background knowledge that they're that they can replicate that. And if the student were to go, were to tilt their head to the side um, with somebody else, it's not replicable. Um, and that there would either be a communication breakdown or they would be unable to um, communicate that, that message. Um, so I think that if you, look, it doesn't just have to be, um, it doesn't just have to be using technology. It doesn't just have to be, you know, YouTube. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly a lot easier because with YouTube, you have access to, uh, scroll and find what you're looking for at your fingertips, literally. But, um, you know, it doesn't, communication does not have to be technology. And that's very important to also keep in mind. Um, can I ask you both to, cause I think thinking of YouTube, there is quite a lot of stigma against devices in general. Um, like I know, like even with my daughter, people will make comments because she's got her iPad with her. Um, add in, you know, YouTube or like people being concerned with quote stimming, um, on devices. If you could just talk a little bit about that and why exploration is important for, um, language learning. And if you want to say anything else, please do. <laughs> um, I, this is going to be so person specific. Um, we all use technology for a lot of purposes. And um, I think that I would say that at like the bottom of the list is using it as a distraction. We all use technology as a distraction. Um, but even that in and of itself serves a purpose. Um, and just keeping that in mind that um, AAC, so backing up one more thought, AEC, even if it's technology-based is not considered screen time. Um, we've all made that I think we, the general consensus is, is that it is not screen time at all um, and does not need to be limited in any way. Um, I understand the stigma of 
somebody carrying around um, you know, an iPad or, or technology, you know, a, a tablet um, with them, but it's, it's not screen time. It's their voice and it's what they need to be able to communicate and interact and grow. And, um, you know, it's, it's everything. So they're, and then on the other hand, um, being able to, uh, learn by repetition is really important. So um, I do have students who repeatedly hit the same messages on their communication devices or listen to the same YouTube videos over and over again. Um, Again, there's some, there's definitely benefit to that familiarity, but it's also um, language learning. And also keeping in mind uh, you know, special interests and things like that, that people may have that it, they may want to talk about over and over again. And thinking about it as stimming really removes the communication intent behind it. Um, Marge, do you have any thoughts? I absolutely agree with you, Kate. And, you know, Obviously, speakers are quieted also when they are perceived as, quote, stimming or using echolalia or all these things. And the argument to not stopping someone would be exactly the same. And that is that if an individual is repeating something again and again and again, there's a reason for it. And you could say at the, at the basic level, you know, we didn't used to say stimming. We used to say self-regulation. And now stimming isn't a bad word anymore to a lot of people. I mean, autistic adults would say, you know, it's stimming, it's okay. But I think if one says, what is the definition of stimming? It's self-regulation. And so if something is regulating to hear the same tone again, 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 you go back to, you know, um, oh golly, uh, Donna Williams back in the day when um, autistic adults were starting to write about their experiences. And she would say, you know, she would, she worked, she's a, an aut- autistic adult And she would go into a classroom and she would find a child who was doing a repetitive something, 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 something to self-regulate. And she would say, if I go over and do that, that frees the child to do something that might be more intentional. So we would never take away our, you know, my glasses. Oh, I must push up my glasses or fluff my hair or, you know, all the things that we all do. And we don't go and cut my hair because I'm fluffing it too much to, um, to, to be calm and part of um, a social situation. So it's even worse when we think about taking something off of an AAC. It's, you know, I mean, some of those stories are just unconscionable to think of taking something off because it's stimming. Well, if you took away my self-regulation devices, which I don't even want to tell you all 12 of them right here, but I wouldn't be sitting here today and I don't have any diagnoses except the ones my husband has given me, which sorry. Um, But um, the other thing is I, I, and I'm, I apologize for not remembering her name, but the latest guest, on Barry Prezant's podcast. Do you know her, Jen? She's an autistic adult who was not given access to AAC until she was 18 years. Jordan Zimmerman. Good job. Oh my, a must listen. And I I can't wait to see her movie. Yeah, it's called, um, this is not about me, by the way. It's a documentary. I can't even imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine having been in her shoes and life and 
being as able to articulate to the rest of us how myopic we mm -hmm. are. But one of her comments in the podcast was, until I could carry my AAC with me, I didn't fully trust it because who knows who right. would have changed it right. and what might have happened to it. Yeah. And I think like, just to like tie up that end is that this is about adults with more power, making decisions to limit communication, even if you don't necessarily view it as communication, the child may very well view it that way. And so people need to be super careful about the decisions that they're making because you're like, we're in a position of power as the adults without disability here. So, um, I just wanted to say that, um, and, um, if I could ask you one other thing, so I think you're going to get to this Kate, maybe about, um, favorite AAC devices for adding video or audio clips maybe, but, um, also what another parent said, um, I've seen that my child, when he's upset says, some phrase, which he really meant, but it kind of tells me he's frustrated. How do I make sure I'm analyzing it correctly? I don't know. Okay. So I'm going to, I'll tackle the favorites. Okay. Okay. So, um, I think that it's really important that, um, part of, part of, um, selecting, uh, technology, you know, either an AAC app or, or technology for communication, um, is that you look at the features that somebody needs and you look at the features that, um, a, a system has and continuing with that process is really important, even if it's parent driven. Um, so, any at this point in time, all all AEC apps for the iPad and dedicated devices can do bits and pieces um, of features that would be required um, or desired, I should say, not required, but desired for adding um, in Gestalt's. If um, there's, you know, I don't, there's nothing, there's, there's not going to be a best because this is, this is a long-term decision. I, I really believe that the goal is, is to get them to stage three, at least, you know, breaking down those, those gestalts and looking at, you know, a, a, short-term solution for a, a long-term, like, you know, I look at AEC systems as, as um, something that I, I only want to recommend one system and then the person never outgrows it. That's my, you know, my goal. Um, so I wouldn't want to provide a system that, that is based on the fact that they need um, X, Y, or Z at this specific point in time. Um, you know, or, and limit and limit the possibilities. All of the apps at this point can do what you need them to do. Does that answer the question, Jen? Yeah, I think so. And maybe, um, and continue thing, using what you're using. Yes. I was going to say like, um, because yeah. you said that in the beginning, but in case people were yeah. watching, like yeah. you're not saying go out and buy no. and get a whole and that's why and that's specifically why I'm not telling you anything more than what I'm telling you because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anybody changing what they're doing <laughs> yeah yeah it's a very big deal to have to change a language system right. right um okay and so um Marge I don't know if you want to okay so let me read the question again and then he also added some follow-up so he said, I've seen with my child that when he's upset, he says some phrase, which he really meant, but it kind of tells me he's frustrated. How do I make sure I'm analyzing it correctly? To elaborate, he says, call X person when he's upset. 
he doesn't mean to call the person. I've not seen him saying or any such melodies for other things. So it sounds like the gestalt is call this person. And he says, he seems right. to say it when he's upset. Right. I he, say, just believe your gut. Yeah, because I can hear myself in like, oh, you know, call the fire department, call the, you know, call 911, call, you know, do something. I just, yeah, let's get out of this mess. And what, you know, I, I go back to what Kate has said about the, the shared referencing is that if, let's just say you're not interpreting it correctly and you say to this child, yeah, I'm going to call, I mean, let's just say it was grandma. I'm going to call grandma. Yeah, let's talk to grandma. That's going to make us feel better. And let's say he didn't really mean that. He meant like, you know, call the dog because it would be a lot of fun to play with the dog right now. Let's just say he meant really, let's just have some fun. And all, and, and that would, be, but, but it's not bad to say, call grandma because, oh, let's talk to grandma about this. But then he's not very happy with your response, let's just say. And then the next time you say, yeah, let's call Rover over here. He'll make, he'll cheer us up. So you don't have to be right the first time, you know, that's one of the adages. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, like you both mentioned before that part of this is showing them that you're curious and you do recognize it as communicative. So like that really is the most important part here, right? Like we don't, That's I mean, right. we're, we're not going to get it right at all times, but the important part is that we're trying. Right. And what you're pointing out, Jen, is that, you know, this is all a partnership. And so you and your child are in this together and hopefully, you know, forever and ever. And so the outside world is one thing, but we're going to be partners. Mm -hmm. And so if I get it wrong, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, adults get it wrong all the time, but that doesn't stop the partnership. It just, sometimes it just solidifies it because you say, yeah, okay, so we're not going to call grandma this time. Let's call, you know, 911 and say, no, we can't do this anymore, you know, whatever it is. But I mean, you then start to broaden the fact, this is where I, have, I think about it as at a language development level, you start to broaden the idea that you could call this person for this thing, you could call this person for this thing. And that really is what you do with gestalts is you do learn to break them down. And like Kate says, you get to stage two, which is gonna get you to stage three. Okay, anything else, Jen? I mean, there are other things, um, let me see. Oh, uh, one other person had mentioned, which we talked about this in your last webinar, I think, Marge, but um, communication passports can be a potential like aid here for, you know, people to encourage the shared referencing with others. Um, and you can find those online. Um, just, you can just Google communication passport, I think, and, and things will come up. Um, all right, I think we can, I think you can move on to the next. Hey, Marge, how about going over the first page of the handout? And that way people have some ideas of, um, phrases that they could be adding. That would be, so the goal is, is that we start giving, um, AC users, gestalts that are easily mitigated because to infinity and beyond and I like to be with my I like to spend time with my family are much harder to break down than and still maintain some meaning versus um, other other phrases. So I asked Marge to um, come up with some, a list for us and she did. And, and first I said, no, ha ha. <laughs> well, I know I, I'm very happy to come up with a list, but I think here's the caveat as Joe is finding page one. <laughs> um, so the caveat first is that this is not 
teaching language. This is not saying you should use this language. Even you parents and SLPs and teachers out there, nobody should use this language. This is just, these are just ideas. And, um, you know, call so-and-so is a wonderful gestalt that can, can be used to get to stage two and, you know, it's perfect. So if you've got something that's perfect in your life right now, you don't need to use any of these things. If you don't have anything that's perfect and like, you know, all you have is a couple of to infinity and beyonds, you know, these might be worthy of, of trying out. And that's what we're doing right now is like, you know, Kate and Jen have said at the beginning, we don't have answers right now. We have lots of people thinking and really trying to apply some of the principles to their own child and their own student. So play with it. If it doesn't fly, it doesn't fly. So um, I love, personally, I love let's. And so, um, but you don't, it doesn't have to be let's. Like something that is connecting, absolutely. It's requesting, which we all love to think that kids will be able to request what they want. And that's part of that referencing. You know, we, we aren't just, you know, just crazy because we want to want kids to ask for what they want. I mean, it is something that, you know, it is a, is a place of connection. It's a place of joint referencing. So, but you can do it with other words besides the ones that we've sometimes ruined by trying to, you know, teach kids or model and not model, but prompt kids to say, or to use, you know, we've kind of ruined it a little bit. So let's is lovely. As long as we say it or use it or suggest it as a gestalt, only when it's something that's lovely. So we don't want to say, let's get your boots on right now. You know, that's, that's not a very good use of, of let's. That's not a very good model. But if it's fun, if it's going to the beach, if it's going to the pool, if it's things that you love, then let's get or let's go. If you have one from YouTube or from something that's fun, it comes from a story, um, you know, I always do use the one that has been meaningful to me, let's get out of here, only because my very first Gestalt language processor used that particular one. So it's always been resonant, resonant to me. But so let's get it, you know, let's get going. Um, let's get toys, you know, whatever might be the, the, the gestalt that your family might naturally say, let's I'm gonna, get some ice cream, let's I'm get gonna, McDonald's. I'm going to step in here for one second. When you're adding these to AAC devices, um, you have to add the whole thing. You can't just add, let's get, and then in individual boxes, put that in, out, snack. You have to put the whole thing. It's the, it's the complete message that matters. So you can put right. choices. So for instance, you would say one box would have, let's get that. Yes, because okay. it's the whole, because it's the whole phrase. Right. Um, and then a second box could say, let's get mom, but to the person, those are gonna be two separate things. They're not gonna be able to separate out until stage two, where they start those mitigations. They're not gonna be able to separate out, let's get mom and let's get snack. So as, as Kate is pointing out, it's going to take a bit of detective work to decide what that, what an already existing gestalt like situation or episode might be in your, in your family and in your home environment, like, uh, let's get dinner, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be get or go. I mean, it could be, let's make cookies, or if there's something that's like, um, let's find a pumpkin. It could be anything that you feel 
is something that your child is already thinking in their heads. And this goes back to what we've said earlier, is this isn't about the language as much as it's about the processing. So the particular words don't matter nearly as much as something that resonates in your, in your child's mind. Let's get our toys. If that's something that everybody loves in your household because they've all been you know, doing homework or whatever, let's get our toys. So that's on there, like it says, we're done. We're done with homework. We're done with you know, whatever we were doing, the cleaning up, and it's time to move on to let's get our toys. And it could be just a transition point to, oh, let's have some fun. And it could be that, let's have some fun. Let's get together. Um, Other thoughts? No, I, I mean, I was just gonna say that I think it's spot on because so much of this is about the meaning for the kid. And so even as, even as people are starting to like add in, you know, choose these phrases, like whatever is most meaningful for the child is gonna, you know, mm -hmm. it's gonna connect the best. Right, and actually, Jen, that's totally it. I mean, there's, there's really nothing else but that. Yeah. And so let's look at, at, at the second one, it's. You know, it's incredibly useful, and it's wonderful at stage two, like Kate is saying, but the beginning point might be like, you know, it's mine, no, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine you know, putting on it's mine, you know, that would be tremendously resonant if, if that were the case. Um, or it could be, you know, um, oh, it's so good for you to eat your peas and carrots. It's not either. You know, it could be, it could be anything that, it, that truly is resonant as a beginning point. Um, can I ask a question? Someone has so if the child is pretty firmly in stage two, would you then begin to prompt to program a mitigated custodials? That is yeah. beautiful. Yay for this child. Let's <laughs> get a little video of this child. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you don't really have to go back to a gestalt at that point. If, if in fact you've got buy-in to whatever, you know, is this with an AAC um, device? Yeah, because they said, would you begin the program? So. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Well, stay and in I, touch with us. Yeah. The other thing that I would add is, is that if you're brand new to this, please do not put all of this on there. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, pick one, two, like, find like a, a an easy starting spot. Um because I could totally picture somebody getting really excited and putting all of this on there, yeah. um, which is going to be very overwhelming for everyone. Um, so pick something that resonates or something that um, I like to look at, like where communication breakdowns are occurring and then being able to provide language for, you know, before that exists. So like, you know, starting with protesting, I know that's further down in, in the list, but things like don't, um, so, or just, you know, picking something that's important that serves a function, do, please do not put, like, go and put, like, 14 gestalts on the person's communication device, feeling like you have to take all of those categories and put two on there so you have something to mitigate in the future. Right. And that, that goes back to the, the, the buy-in. I mean, we, we want to be really gentle here and we want to preserve the relationship and, you know, first do no harm. We want to make sure that everything about, you know, the environment and, and the home situation and the respect and all of those things are absolutely intact. So, yeah. you know, exactly like Kate says, we want to take it as we don't slowly want and as carefully and as yeah. individually as 
as as ensures that everything else is intact. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Marge. I was just going to say that we don't want it to seem like work or pressure, which is a big, especially. I mean, Kate knows this with the AAC that that's like a huge um, problem for a lot of people because you know it's like an easy way to kind of almost drill someone or test someone you know, when you have a, a, a language device. So, um, but you know, that's, this is all about communication and connection. And that's what the, that's what programming these gestalts would be for too. And Kate would say this way better than me, but this is, this is to help, you know, it's to help the child. I mean, <laughs> that we need to say that, you know, we do need to say that mm -hmm. is to help. Um, and if it isn't helping, and if we have to drill something, if we have to prompt something, it's clearly not helping. Yeah. Um, Kate, just, this is maybe uh, off topic slightly, but just since you're here and a lot of people don't necessarily get access to an AAC specialist, um, someone asked if their school therapist doesn't agree that the child is better using Proloquo for texts. Um, the whole speech team in school is familiar with Proloquo picture-based only. Um, any advice? So they want to use Proloquo for text and the school wants them to use Proloquo with pick to go. Yeah. Um, what does the AAC user prefer? So yeah, that's a very good question. Um, let's see, whoever wrote that. Um, so the first question would be, what does your child prefer? Um, and the parent this, is, go ahead. I will say um, that uh, obvious, first comes, you know, um, preference, but when you're looking at being able to, um, for those of you who don't know, um, Proloquo for text is a, uh, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a text-based um, AEC app, and um, it does not have any symbols other than the written word, um, no picture symbols, I should say. Um, where Proloquo to go would have uh, that that text uh, that um, those picture symbols paired with the text. Um, it does also have a keyboard, so you would be able to have both. Um, it requires Proloquo for text requires a um, a certain level of skill because you have to essentially type everything that you're saying, think about like having a text conversation, you know, like a texting conversation with somebody. You have to think about what you're saying, think about the spelling of it and type it out. Um, some AAC users uh, who are adults prefer um, word-based systems because it's actually faster in some cases because they, you know, to type a long word, um, is going to be significantly more selections on a keyboard than it would be to just pick a word. Um, you know, if they wanted to say Tyrannosaurus Rex, just as an example, to be able to think about it and type Tyrannosaurus Rex versus going in and in, you know, two or three hits, being able to make a selection and have it recall the whole word, um, maybe faster. So there are pros and cons of both systems, but I definitely would defer to user preference, especially if they're typing, you know, yeah. what, what do they prefer? Yeah. And, you know, to the parent, again, you're part of the IEP team and it's individualized educational program. So it should be geared toward what's what the child wants and naturally <laughs> prefers. Um, can I ask you one other question, Kate? Yeah. So in talking about mitigating gestalts on an AAC, um, let's say, so someone brought up um, 
let's go as a, you know, that's one of the common gestalts. So at that point, if you were to mitigate that, um, and they're talking, I think they're on lamp. So, um, and I know that you don't want to get too in the weeds with individual programs, but, um, so they said that, um, let's is a two button click word and go is a two button. So like modeling let's go would be four clicks to model the two separate words. Um, but I guess, so that's kind of the point of all of this though, that there's a lot of things that are not ideal at this point. Okay. So first of all, AEC is inherently slow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So everybody thinks that it would be faster and it certainly would in certain, in, in some aspects to have a button that said, let's go and have every, if you could have your whole message programmed on every button, you know, even longer things, you know, I, uh, we need milk today, whatever, you know, whatever the, whatever the statement is, um, you still need to learn how to build those sentences and let's is two hits and go is two more hits, but that's the way the system is designed. You will always have multiple selections for individual words and no matter what system you use. Um, and some systems have, are more efficient and some are less efficient with regard to, um, you know, the number of hits you have. Um, so I think, I think thinking about it in terms of like number of hits is getting very specific in terms of can, can the child access let's, can the child access go so that they can say, um, let's go, but they can also say, uh, go school, go bus, go home, what, you know, which are all going to be used in many more different combinations, um, to be able to, if you think about it, typing go is going to be two hits anyway. Right. You know, it's so. <laughs> right. Like, you know, it's like you said, AAC is just inherently, you know, slow because it's, there's so many words that have to be, you know, right. added in there. So. Um, but uh, just to add one thing is Katie is one of our acknowledged experts in this area. And so there are a lot of questions yet to be answered. And She's got a lineup of things in her future that are going to address a lot of these issues. So in the meantime, and, and we don't, you know, we don't have the answers and, and, and all of these concerns that people have are real legitimate concerns that we all have. And we are attempting as a large community to address them. They haven't been all addressed, no question. But one thing that I would say is we haven't really showcased the number of people who have been experimenting in their homegrown variety of adding gestalts. And um, Kate, do you remember? There's a, uh, please feel invited to the Facebook group that is um, Gestalt Language Processing and AAC. Is that? The correct I think that's correct. Name. Yeah, you'll um, find it if you. And we can link to it. Okay. Right. Good. 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 Because there are some amazing people who are trying things out, and until we get better answers, you know, it's really going to be up to all of us, I think, to be those qualitative researchers who are going to try some things and see what flies see what flies with a particular child. So if let's get is just not on anybody's radar, you know, for any number of reasons, then don't even go there. Don't just don't go there. Um, there are other ways of inviting people, you know, you know, yeah, there's, there are other alternatives. Um, the other thing that I, with. the other thing that I want to add at this point is, is that, 
because that we're advocating for sticking with the system that you're already using or the person is already using, I should say, there's going to be numerous ways that you can break down mitigations depending on, and that's going to be system specific. Um, there's, and I have, I've either tried or seen tried a number of different ways. Um, and there's no research as to what should be done right now. This is like yep. completely brand new. So um, if you have specific questions about how other people have tried to demonstrate um, stage two mitigations on systems, going to that Facebook group would be a good, a good bet um, or getting creative. Each, I think right now, each, um, because of the limitations of every system, um, you're gonna, there's gonna be different ways of doing it that, that may, that may work. And once you um, join that particular group, there are a couple of others that um, some very innovative people have begun. And you're gonna be inspired because, you know, we don't have the answers. But boy, people are thinking about it. And I think the creativity, like, you know, Kate says about the creative, the creative process, that's the stage we're in right now. And it will certainly continue. So let's, let's forget let's <laughs> and just <laughs> move on to something else like, like, you know, and you can do a lot of things. You don't have to you know, request that everybody join together and go to McDonald's. That doesn't, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, at, at, this, at this first step, we just want the child to know that there is this gestalt that you recognize. And so you could say, you could say out loud, hey, let's, let's get um, a book. Like books, like that book? like, you know, um, Dora, you know, like, etc. So you could, you could model some possibilities where the child could then, you know, experience that gestalt, like, like Dora again, you know, that might be something that, a, a you know, another sibling would be protesting. And, and so the comeback um, for this AAC communicator is like Dora. Yeah. Um, can I ask you another question from someone? Um, if child scripts songs and rewatches videos repeatedly by himself and laughs, communicative intent isn't obvious, but is their main verbal output? Would you assume Gestalt language processor? Are they the same songs? Um, Bryn, can you clarify, are they watching the same songs over and over? I mean, they said rewatches videos repeatedly. I mean, I guess that doesn't guarantee anything, but yes, <laughs> you know, yes. And that's where, I mean, that's really a gift. I mean, that is such a beautiful, you know, uh, window into the things that matter. And just to talk about the repetition for just a moment, um, you know, lots of kids, I mean, all little kids like the same stories read over and over again. So that doesn't necessarily say that um, that child is a Gestalt language processor. But on the other hand, there's something really precious about the repeating because not only is it comforting and comfortable, but there's something about that repetition that's important. And oftentimes for a Gestalt processor, it's to get to the part that is the most meaningful. And sometimes if, a, if an individual is speaking, they might start to fast forward and fast forward through the part that isn't so relevant as like, you know, um, Christmas tree. You know, it could be da 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 Christmas tree da 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 da. In the child's mind, it could be the processing could be like I want to isolate Christmas tree. 
So there's a lot of detective work that can be done when there's repetition. So it really is a gift. I mean, it is a, a little window into what's important, whether it's a Gestalt language processor or not, it's a wonderful window. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really, um, I love the way that you put that. Um, all right, so we're gonna have to be wrapping up soon. So what, what would both of your final thoughts be on this and, and where do we go next? Well, I have a personal preference <laughs> and that everybody would log in with their thoughts, their questions, their ideas, their little home experiments and that we do this again later in the spring. Okay. Um, this is, as, as we keep repeating, this is so new. Um, so I think just trying what, AEC is already very individualized. So trying something and finding what works for someone is the most important thing. So um, don't be afraid to jump in and find that connection because that's really, really what matters. Yeah. Um, and I'll just say like, as someone who's trying to navigate this myself is um, like, you really can't, you can collect information from other people and like, we should all share as many ideas as we can. Um, but what like, you know, Kate and Marge both said is so true that there's not necessarily one recipe um, when it comes to this. And so for me, the key is just always being curious and responsive and assigning as much meaning as I can. And I'm not going to get it right all of the time, but she knows I'm trying. And so that alone keeps her wanting to, to continue trying to, to help me get it. <laughs> so, um, you know, to everyone out there who's watching, like a lot of this can be overwhelming, um, especially if you don't really have like a language background. And like, I've talked to Marge and Kate about this extensively that like, it can feel confusing and overwhelming and like you need to have all of the answers right now. And, but listen to Kate and Marge that you don't need to have all of the answers right now. And again, the important part is just like being aware. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned from you both in this last year is just like, even if we think we know a lot, there's so much more to learn. And, um, the fact that like Marge, you know, you've been talking about this research now that's been around for decades and, you know, people were aware of this sort of language development for, you know, however, whatever the exact number of years is now. Um, and so, and, but people were still thinking about mostly speakers, but I think the point here is just realizing that even if you can't speak with your mouth, you can still have natural language acquisition and development. And, you know, that's like, you're not counted out just because you can't speak with your mouth. So. Jen, why is it that we need you to remind us what this was all supposed to be about? So, yes. I mean, let's just say the thing that, that um, SLPs, speech language pathologists would always say out loud, and that is speech is not language and language is not speech. And when we think about language, sometimes we think, oh, that word, well, no. This is about language processing. What's going on in your head? And basically it has nothing to do with speech. Language processing happens in your head and speech is just a modality for expressing it. That's all. Yeah. I think that on that note, um, 
as Marge said, please, you can feel free to join that um, group. I posted it in the chat, um, but you can also, if you're on Facebook, just search for um, AAC and Gestalt language. Um, and um, I'm sure that Marge is at least going to be back multiple more times. Um, <laughs> she's a, she's our favorite. And um, no, but I mean, this, I, I think like, people appreciate so much hearing all of this reframed and having the research and realizing that the way that language development has been stigmatized in autism is wrong. And, you know, trying to correct that now, I think is incredibly important. Um, uh, let me just see. Okay, everyone, everyone is extremely grateful. Everyone's commenting how helpful this was. Um, so again, um, you can join the Facebook groups. Um, we posted the handout in this chat. It's also available on our website now. Thank you, Joe, for adding that. Um, and please feel free to reach out um, if anyone has questions, you know, that you felt weren't answered or, you know, you can post in the group. It's, it's very supportive. Um, Thank you both so much to Kate and Marge for being here and for being brave enough to explore these things when you know that there's no solid, you know, prescription um, at this point. So um, thank you again. And uh, I will see everybody a week from today. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Thanks, Kate.